want to talk about it more when we get up on stage. But I really just want to introduce you know, this, this sister and this brother right here. Sade Chase Marshall and McCurry Pew. Please come to the stage as I introduce y'all. Let's give them a hand, y'all. Let's give them a hand. Let's give them a hand. Let's give them a hand. two guests to talk more about themselves, but just a slight introduction about who we're dealing with tonight, just so you guys know. When you hear this, this is real talk right here. So I think Chase Marcel, this sister, she's currently working in the IT field, and at the same time, she's, she has properties, a couple properties, and she'll talk more about that. And her ultimate goal is to help fund black businesses, or to help, you know, entrepreneurs who are, uh, who, who yearn to thrive in the business field to get more money, pretty much. Uh, I would like for her to talk about that more, but Sade, um, in doing this, her ultimate goal is to create various streams of revenue where in a situation her employer cuts her off or something like that, she always has something to fall back on. And she suggests that for everybody else, you know, who's in our situation. Um, McCary Pugh, this brother is from the D.C. area. He went to North Carolina uh, for a little bit. Uh, he's been involved in business since... Um, I would say, what, like adolescence or pre-adolescence, like, you know, yeah, you know, so, you know, just a yearning to do for himself, right, you know, and because he asked his parents for something and they wanted him to hold up his end of the bargain, he went out there and he got it, you know, and that was where the business acumen started, and that pretty much translated into the world of sports and just other industries, so we really have to, you know, pay attention to our um, brothers and sisters here, you know. Uh, once again, you know, thank y'all for coming on the All Eyes on BC show. It's always a pleasure. Please take your mics. I'm about, to, I'm about to stop talking so much, and I'm about to just have y'all school us for real. Um, so, anything that, that I missed in our introduction of you, you know, that you want the audience to know about your craft uh, and just what you do in terms of setting up yourself financially? Um, I, I, is it on? Okay. So I think you covered most of it. I do. So I do work in IT uh, for NASA. I do IT project management and pro program support. Um, so that is my main uh, career, so to say. But I do do own a couple of properties, and then as well, I'm looking to invest in my sister's business that she's currently trying to start up, and as well a couple of friends. Um, so yeah. So. Yeah, so um, I'm actually a teacher by trade. Uh, that's my day job, I'm a teacher. I do own for investment properties and also trade stocks. So that's where I get kind of my other income from. Um, so we'll, we'll get into that a little more. But my supreme goal is uh, financial literacy. Um, forums like this where we can come out and kind of share what's worked as a community and uh, begin to cultivate ideas and move forward as a, as a people. Perfect, thank you. Um, before we get into it, let's, lay the, let's get a lay of the land. From your understanding, if you can think deeply about this, what is the current state of black people in America collectively? I'm talking about along all class levels, not just our celebrities. Let's think about this as a collective. If if black America, 13%, was its own nation today, if that goal got carried out, what would our financial situation be as a nation? So I think it depends on how we're looking at the question. Now, if we're saying that black people are dependent on one another, then we would be doing very well. But if we're not forced to be dependent on one another, we're not doing so well at all. Collectively, where our wealth is currently dropping, um, along with Latinos' wealth as well, because uh, after the crash or the bubble burst of the housing market in 2006, we haven't been able to rebuild build and get back to the amount of wealth that we had beforehand. Personally, I think that the financial situations, it's not good right now. And the reason why I say that is because, you know, all day I'm reading statistics, you know, seeing the news, I'm reading whatever. And, and when you look at the average uh, white household that's considered middle class, the net worth is 110,000. The average net worth of a black household that is supposedly middle class is 5,000. That's a huge income discrepancy. So that tells you right there, even if we're making money income wise, we don't actually have any wealth. And that's what concerns me. Having an income that's large, that's easy to do. Having wealth to pass down so we're not starting over every generation, that's difficult. I think as a nation, we would be starting over every 50 years if it was just us. And pretty much beyond 
the housing crisis and the residue from that, what other reasons could that be? You know, people would probably say that we don't own industries or that we're not, you know, going into business. But at the same time, how can somebody who, like you said, get a high income, how can they finagle that into a business if they got to put all their nine to five and beyond into that high income job? Well, you need to switch jobs. So, um, like for, for me last year, I switched jobs twice because I needed to be able to have the flexibility in order to work on different business ventures that I wanted to work on. And then as well, sometimes pick up odd jobs. Like when I was trying to buy my first house, I was working my regular full-time job. I was also driving Lyft, and then I was also bartending as well. I didn't sleep much, but I had to do what I needed to do in order to save up for a deposit and um, yeah, <laughs> basically be able to get the house that I wanted. So I, I don't want to say it's easy because it's not easy. Um, it's def definitely difficult. You definitely have to make sacrifices. You definitely have to have self-discipline in order to do it. But if you want it, it's possible and you can get it. I think if you want more, you have to do more. And I think that in order for our circumstance to change individually and as a people, we have to change. So Sade talked about you know, how she kind of grinded it out at an early age. I was in a similar boat. My first job, I was only making $19,000 a year. That's out of college. Um, I was a teacher assistant. I was making $19,000 a year. Now with that $19,000 a year, I actually bought my first property. So people think, oh, I gotta make all this money before I buy properties. My first property I bought, I was making $19,000 a year. And similar to you, I had the job working as a teacher assistant. Then in the evenings, I would go to the college and I would work as a study hall proctor. And at the time, I was also in grad school. Now, my thought process was always, I'm 24 years old, if I'm gonna work this hard, it needs to be now, rather than later, right? The worst thing in the world is being 40 years old, being 50 years old, and then having to work harder than when you could have done it in your 20s, so that's when you have the energy to do it. So we gotta think about when we have the energy to do things and hit it hard then. But the opportunities abound, you know? Uh, it's still generally the best time that it's ever been. You know, you have the internet now. We're not going to encyclopedias for information. Um, if I want to flip houses, I can go to YouTube. Somebody's doing it. I can watch a show about it. Um, connecting with people is a couple clicks of a button. Um, so I think we got to stop looking at what we can't do and look at what we can do because kind of the excuses are kind of falling by the wayside with this interconnected world we have now. So, you know, you touched on just the fact that information is pretty accessible right now. You know, how did that translate why doesn't that translate into action for people? With, with, with all these opportunities out there, one could argue that you know um, there's a whole boatload of like new trades, you know, new industries to go into. What is the disconnect for our people? You know, what is that? Why is it that we're catching up like ten years later after the new trend comes out? Um, well, I wouldn't necessarily say that we're playing catch up. I do think that in general these people are very creative and are able to make memes in various fashions and forms. Um, it may not be reported on necessarily. Um, and I also don't tend to not really follow like the unemployment rate necessarily because it just shows like workers who dropped out but not actually people who might be doing ins and outs jobs. Um, that's not shown for. But I do think the issue isn't necessarily us making money. Um, well, it, it's there, but I think what it is is passing on that wealth to younger generations, generational wealth. That's where we're suffering and hurting the most. I agree. I think that old money comes with old lessons, and that's one of the things that we don't have. So I went to the University of Georgia for undergrad and Colorado for undergrad. And what I learned about those students is that some of those kids went to school on trust funds from their grandparents. So I learned very quickly that old money had old lessons. So uh, my family may make a lot of money, but there's still not that knowledge of generational wealth, how money actually works, how it flows, how it comes in and out. So I think that's a big thing, definitely with the, the generational wealth piece. When it comes to making money, but still not taking advantage of the opportunities that are out there, I think it's an overarching challenge that we have culturally with the images that are pumped out to us as children, right? It's all about consumerism. We have an entire uh, music form that is dedicated to consumerism, right? I'm a teacher, I teach in Southeast Ward 8, and I have children who are homeless, but they have iPhone X's and they have Jordans. And they're clowning me like, oh, Mr. Pugh, you ain't got no money because you got on the no-brand loafers. So when you think about the, the culture of consumerism, we don't have a culture of it's cool to, uh, to make more money, it's just about how it looks. So we're judging on the wrong things, unfortunately.
you know, both of y'all touched on a lot of great points. You know, Shade just because being creative and Perry talking about knowledge around um, knowledge around just how to consume and what to consume. Uh, literacy often, you know, let, let's talk more about that part, you know, just, you know, knowledge around the laws, you know, and all of that. How important, how pivotal was literacy, you know, for you guys making, you know, leaps and bounds in the industry, just knowing the ins and outs of pretty much what it is that you do as far as buying property and stuff like that? You want to go ahead? <laughs> so, I mean, literacy just generally is key, right? Um, if you're not literate, you can't access society to a certain level. There's a certain level of literacy needed to be able to uh, take in and interpret information, right? And I think that fundamentally, um, if you haven't been taught to think for yourself, and that could be somebody who has gone to college and just has been you know, eating what they've been fed their entire life, if you don't learn to think for yourself, that's the first issue. Um, legality is always important, it's always a factor, particularly for a black person, because when we start to do well, they come after you. We see that with some of our celebrities, we see that with the Dave Chappelle's, the we see that all across the culture. They, They'll find something. Tax evasion is how they get a lot of the, the mobsters, right? So um, that's key, knowing the ins and outs of the law. So for me, my strategy is before I go to make a purchase or before I go um, to make any type of financial move, I have a group of people I consult, a realtor, I have a friend who's a lawyer, I have a friend who's a financial advisor, out on top of the reading I already do. So no one person knows everything they need to know. You have to hit that network, and that's something we have to do as a culture as well. We gotta find those people who are doing it, and we gotta create those networks. I agree, uh, it's extremely important. And I understand or know how important it is more now as an adult versus when I was a child, obviously, and how it is a hindrance for us not knowing and having that financial literacy. Um, I did do a lot of my own research and luckily we have the internet now <laughs> versus years ago when all that information wasn't <laughs> as viable as it is right now. Um, I do know a few people, as McCurry mentioned, um, a real estate agent, loan officer, various people who are um, experts within those various fields that help to basically make me make the best decision for me, which might not be the best decision for someone else, but it helped me to strategize in order to get to where I want to be. So, like part of financial literacy is not just about making money, it's about putting out goals and saying, okay, this is where I wanna be, how do I get there? And then navigating your way to that, through that path, so. How do we bridge that information gap? Well, first of all, let's give them a hand for this information, y'all, please. You know, like, you know, they, There seems to be an information gap, from what I can see at least um, in the reporting that I've done and I've read. Um, everything that you guys are speaking about, you know, a segment of our population already knows that, of course, and they're working with that, thank goodness. There's a, another segment of our population, you know, who has no access to that information. They're living day to day, they're getting out of the mud, you know, pretty much, like that's, that's just what it is. How do we bridge that gap between those two groups? How do we get beyond um, stereotypes that each group may feel about one another, the resentment that the group may have against the other group and vice versa? It's oftentimes what I see is a lot of ego, right? You know, hey, I don't want to learn that. That's that white stuff. Or, you know, with the other side pretty much condemning their poor counterparts for their condition. So, you know, have you, let's just give that some thought. How do we bridge that gap so that everybody's eating? Everybody's working for their piece of the brain. I think you're speaking to a larger cultural issue of the haves and have nots in our own community, right? So I think as a black person, when you do get to a certain income level, you do get a certain level professionally, you kind of have a choice to make, right? Um, do I still identify with those people who haven't gotten where I'm at, or do I turn my back on those people, right? And we see that with certain people in politics who you came from this area, but now you're representing this group of people as if you never. Are them so the first thing we have to do is we got to remember we're all the same people whether you know my parents make it out and make a lot of money or your parents don't we're still black people when we walk down the street they look at us the same um, that was something I learned when I was going through my experiences trying to figure out like what side of this whole thing I was gonna fall on like is it their fault and I have these debates with my friends once again I'm a school teacher I teach in Southeast so you know 
I'll explain situations with about my students, and they're like, well, why don't they do better, or why isn't it like that, or why do their parents make those decisions? And that's when you gotta kind of talk about the system that's been put in place, and really an artificial system of poverty in DC, which we can get into a little more later, but an artificial system of poverty, um, which is much more powerful than, you know, a natural system uh, of poverty. Um, well, to answer your question, conversations like this is one of those major steps, and one of the major reasons why I came out here. I feel as though, um, I feel as though I take on part of that responsibility because I feel as though I should share as much of the information that I've gained to help others, especially younger ones coming in behind me. Um, and I think that you know having more opportunities to get young people involved in learning about budgeting their finances, like small things like that that's not really taught in schools is a great first step in getting um, children hungry enough or interested in enough and learning and trying to manage the, their finances in their life. I think that you know once you have that basic grounding, then it's easier to feed more information versus someone who's never had to balance their their checking account or what have you and now trying to introduce all these different financial terms and things of that nature it's kind of difficult um i also i mean i feel as though there are also a lot of older individuals in the, in the baby boomer generation and what have you that have a lot of information that they're not sharing with us <laughs> And um, I'm not sure how to combat that necessarily as of yet, but I, I was talking to McCary about this earlier that oftentimes when I have had conversations with individuals within that generation group, I'll find out certain things about where they're investing and this and the third. I'm like, I'm wondering why we're not sharing this information with more younger people coming up and helping them in terms of giving them the, the necessary guidance that they need because it would be very helpful. I'm not saying that this is everyone because that there are older individuals that have helped me, but just something else. And I think yeah. this is this is part of the place where we differ, right? Um, so you felt like it was more of the, the older generation not sharing. Um, I used to think the same thing until I got older and I became not somebody who's of an older generation, but somebody who did have information. And what I realized is that people were not really receptive to it. So what I learned was that the, the people who sought out the information were much more inclined to listen, to use it. I, hadn't, I haven't been able to figure out how to make somebody understand that this information is important. How do I make you understand that financial literacy is important and you don't think you have a financial liter literacy issue, right? Like you don't think you have an issue, so how am I gonna explain this to you? How are you gonna receive it? Um, I'll tell you a story. The first time I saw a million dollars in a bank account, was somebody of that baby boomer generation. I was uh, hanging out with one of my friends and, and meeting their family members, and one of them had mentioned that I invest. So then, you know, once he found out I invested, he started asking me questions, and he was like, oh, you know what, let me show you my portfolio, let me give you some tips on what I do. But it was that initial interest in knowing I had at least taken that first step to want to be conscious, to want to understand finances, um, to want to change my situation, that the information became available to me. And here's why we disagree. <laughs> because it doesn't make sense to me for someone to take initiative to do something that they didn't have no knowledge of, right? Like if you have absolutely no knowledge of what to what how to invest in stock, why would you then ask a question about it? Like I I understand that someone taking initiative does make someone of the older generation more open to it, but to me, I feel as though they should just be pushing and trying to share that knowledge, whether someone's receptive to it or not, until eventually that information gets through. Yeah. So let's talk about it. Like, why, why the disconnect? Because you're pretty, this sounds like two, two different sides of the same coin, right? At what point, why is it that, and again, not trying to make a blanket statement, but if the baby boomer generation, right, after, you know, affirmative action policies and civil rights victories, right, and just a boom in education, attainment, and, you know, um, corporate, you know, corporate jobs and vice versa, right, why is it that we didn't get into the habit, you know, and again, not blaming the baby, not blaming any particular person, but what is it, why is it that, that information, why, you know, 
what is it going to take for us, right, pretty much to combat that, right, and like institutionalize within our families the passing of, of, of information between generations, you know, because this sounds like to me it's a, it's a problem that's like relegated to the home. It's like, it doesn't sound, you know, it sounds systemic, but it sounds like it's something that could be solved from home to home, from community to community. I think it's I think it's twofold. I think it's twofold. I think that that generation had opportunities to make money, like you talked about um, government jobs, for instance. They had a different opportunity to make money, right? So they learned kind of how to get a job, how to get a degree, how to get educated. But I don't think they learned yet how to build wealth. So I think it's one thing to do better financially. It's another thing to build wealth. Those are two different things. So yes. They've got money, they've got good jobs, they've bought the house in BG County, they've been able to send their children to private school. But when we look at actual wealth per capita, like I go back to that middle class household, black household situation of $5,000, they don't know how to build wealth. And like you said earlier, the same job opportunities that they had are now shrinking and disappearing. So what we thought was that we would go and we would work for the government like they did, and we would make our money and we would drive the BMW and all that good stuff, but that didn't happen. I think the second part of that is, that generation wanted to shield us a lot from what they went through, right? So they saw a lot of things we didn't see. And as a result, they didn't want us to suffer through that. So some of the lessons that their parents taught them became lost to us because they were busy kind of shielding us from that hardship, that hurt, and that hunger. Because you gotta think, that generation and what they were able to do was magnificent. But there was a hunger after Jim Crow. There was a hunger after segregation. There was a hunger. We've got equality now. We have to run with it. We're obligated to run with it. We're really only one or two generations away from segregation. So it's like we've already forgot the lessons of segregation and not being able to. And in a way, that was kind of the worst thing that happened to us, because now we have no more hunger. I agree with that. And I also think, I think that Part of it is culturally we're missing this community of helping one another. And I happen to work with a lot of um, Asian people and I've noticed a difference in and amongst themselves with the older generation and passing on that information and knowledge and sharing and us. And I feel like that is something that we as a community need to work on. How we do that, because that's a hard, that's a hard question. I feel as though, you know, engaging more in our political system and building more programs around that financial literacy would definitely help. And that's one way I feel like a, that would be able to combat that. You know that? We got a question about politics later on. You know, there's a very interesting discussion happening. For those of y'all who are Yvette Carnett, Yvette Carnell fans and Boyce Walker fans, you know, it's a very interesting discussion. I want to touch on this piece, you know, so to your point about private schools and all of that, even the education system's changing, right? A lot of our parents, they want their toying with the idea of homeschool collectors, you know, things like that, right? So to me, what it looks like is everything's moving at the very same time, right? We're financially illiterate to a certain degree, our schools are messed up, politics not so, you know, bad at all, like, Let's, let's assume for a second, right, that with this community solution that we have, right, we also insert like an educational system. Um, not to make a meal of it, but how would that look like? You know, how, how, how would that look, you know, as far as just that connection, you know, um, if we have our, our, like, our realtors, our business people, you know, actually like teaching the kids, like how would you envision that happening? Because I feel like with our people, you know, we're, we're not we're not people who compartmentalize stuff. I think that's what it is first of all. Like we look at stuff too compartmentalized, right? Why is it that you know our business people can't be teachers as well? They're the ones right in the industry, right? So with that being said, I want to see what you guys envision for that. Like if you guys could just like create your curriculum right here in front of the audience, right? What would the curriculum look like? You know, especially you being a teacher, right? You know, what, what would that look like? If I wanted to start my own business, if I wanted to, you know, um, take it to the next level and pass on generational wealth, what would that curriculum look like? Hmm. Yeah, that's a loaded question. Um, that's what I do, man. I get loaded <laughs> questions, man, you know. Um, just another, another story. When I first started teaching, 
um, I believe the bank was Wells Fargo. They would send a representative to the school that I was teaching at, and they would have this, you know, segments on financial literacy, how to budget, credit cards, how those work, even student loans and things like that. They kind of gave the kids in middle school like a comprehensive vision of finances. Now, this was, of course, the most uh, white school in the county. This was the most affluent school in the county, and I didn't see that when I went to go work in the poorer schools in the county. So I think the first thing is bringing in community members. Um, this generation of students are kind of like the show me students. They want to they wanna see you drive a BMW before they listen to you, unfortunately, and that's unfortunate. But when you bring in people from the community who, who do have that lifestyle, because they earned it, because they did the right things, because they built businesses, you bring those people into the schools to teach these kids, to talk to these kids about programs. It could be an extracurricular, it could be a career day, it could be anything like that, but that starts the conversation. And from there, you start talking about fundamentals. If a student sees somebody in the position they want to be in, and then you as a teacher begin talking to them about fundamentals stemming from that person who introduced the concept that they respect, then you can start to build it. But the first thing you have to do is actually get the buy-in from the student, and that's the toughest part. They don't respect teachers because teachers, as a profession, are looked at as bottom tier. DC teachers happen to make a lot of money, however, like most of my coworkers make six figures, however, Teaching as a profession is not respected in that way. So I have to bring somebody who is in IT, you know, who, who, who can explain, look, I work with computers, I do X, Y, and Z, and as a result of that, I'm able to live this type of lifestyle. If you want this, let me show you how to do it. And then we start with, well, this is a bank account, and this is an interest rate, and then we go from there. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think economics should be one of those courses, intro to econ, how to budget, you know. <laughs> But I definitely do believe that there should be individuals within the respective careers involved in that. But in order to get them involved in that, um, that becomes a little bit more difficult because each of those different individuals have a different mentality. So if you understand how or why or how they look at processes, it may not actually be for the benefit of the kid, which is unfortunate. But if you turn it in a way and say, okay, you know, the more financially literate these children are, the more likely they'll come to you when they're looking to buy a house, and more likely they'll come to you when they're looking for a potential mortgage to the loan officer, then they'll be like, oh, okay, yeah, let's get involved because then helping them helps us. It's, a, it's not the most positive way to look at it, but I feel as though it would get that information um, out there to them. Yeah, I often feel that myself, to your point about people not really seeing the long term and people maybe going into it for, you know, um, reasons that aren't so selfless. Um, but just really getting beyond, I mean, the whole point to me for real is just building that bridge of information. Um, speaking of information, let's touch on credit. You know, credit is a very big issue in our community across the board. Um, as much as you want to, if you can reflect on your experiences, you know, you don't have to give too much away, but I just want the audience to have an idea of how pivotal credit may have been or not have been in your uh, journey. Cool, credit. All right, so credit kind of goes, and this is where I kind of get into the investor piece, because credit is not inherently bad. We see people like the president, who use credit to increase, to create incredible amounts of wealth, right? So, so credit, loans, all those things can be good things if used properly. Now, if I go and put a pair of Jordans on credit, it's not the same as if I go and I buy a property you know, with a loan, or if I use my credit card to renovate a property or increase equity in my house, right? So you have these different aspects of credit. I've been on both sides of it. Um, I've made credit decisions I shouldn't have made, I wanted to go do something that I didn't have the money to do and I did that and I got to pay it back. But I've also used the majority of my credit in order to build my business. For instance, I don't own four houses without credit. Because when I bought my second house, it was a foreclosure and I didn't have $10,000 to renovate it. Now I had an idea how much the house was going to be worth once I got it renovated. But you know, if the bank wasn't going to give me a loan, I couldn't just go get a business loan or a personal loan. I had to renovate that on credit. Um, so credit can be good, credit can be bad. It just depends on how you use it. It's extremely important. Um, I wouldn't be able to do anything or do any of the investments that I have done without having good credit. And I'll be honest, like I had really bad credit because I refused to pay a Verizon bill. Um, <laughs> and, but in order for me to buy a house, essentially I had to pay that bill off. And so how you should look at it is, is regardless of how bad it is, you can always get out of it. 
you should talk to someone about it um, and basically work with them in order to get your score back up. Because the minute you start paying back um, whatever you owe, then your score just automatically goes up. So it's not hard to fix at all. Follow-up question. What's, that? What, what's the cycle? So like length of time, time period. So from the time when the score falls down, and you really need to get it right back up. Would it be six months, a year, you know? Hypothetical, I know. I mean, it depends. Um, essentially, so if you look at it this way, the creditors report whatever you have um, in terms of payments every 30 days. So every 30 days, they're sending in a notification to the credit bureaus and they're saying, hey, this person still hasn't paid. So you'll see, like, they're late. Um, when you start paying or you pay it back, essentially, then you no longer have that late uh, notification, I guess is what you would call it. Um, it's still showing up as a credit that you have late payments, but now it's showing that you're paying on time. So over a period of time, probably after a couple of months or so, your credit score will start to go a little bit points by point. So um, yeah, it just really it really depends on how bad it is. But I would say like six months to a year, it could actually go all the way back up. So one of the best things I ever did was I signed up one of those credit karma free credit report accounts and it kind of outlined every account I had, late payments, non-late payments. Um, I think credit is just like having a sickness. You need to know exactly what your ailment is. So some people have collections because they didn't pay bills. That's going to take a little longer than if I just have a ratio that's over 25%, over 30%, over 50%. So let's say I have a $10,000 credit line. Once I go over $5,000, my credit is going to take a major drop because I'm using over 50% of my credit line. There are increments. Once you get over 25%, there's a drop. Once you get over 20%, there's a drop. Once you get over 10%, there's a drop, right? So you need to know what those ratios are. If you're below 30%, it's not going to thin your credit that badly. But once you get above that, that's when it starts looking like really bad. Now, if you got revolving debt, credit cards, right? Like when I invest in properties, I have revolving debt numbers that go up. So I might have a $10,000 credit line and I just use $8,000. So the credit score is going to drop. But as soon as you pay that off, within a month or two, that's coming back. I employ people to try to stay away from collections because collections take a long time to get rid of and the process is longer. So you also have to write a letter. You also have to make sure that they actually send it to the credit bureau. There's all these different things that you have to do when you get a collection that you don't have to do when it's just revolving debt. So we gotta know what's more dangerous as well and that affects our credit worse, right? Like that Verizon bill, you probably didn't think like this Verizon bill is gonna tear my credit up. $30. No, I, I knew. Oh, you knew? Okay. I was going to my own way. <laughs> Because I felt like I didn't owe them, but <laughs> I had to pay it anyway. Um, but you're correct about the collections. But even if you do have some items in collections, that doesn't mean you still can't buy a house. I mean, your credit score might not be the best. You might not be able to get the best interest rate. But from a loan officer's perspective, and this is why it's important to talk to the loan officer about your finances, they may be able to wait it out a little bit and be like, okay, we made concurrent payments on this, so you're fine. And so absolutely, there are hundreds of loan products, and there's a loan product. If you have a 580, you can buy a house. FHA alone, you might need. If you have a 580, you can go buy a house. I've never had over. Hold on one second. Break it down for us. Uh, people who might not know FHA and 580. So Federal Housing Association. So um, FHA is essentially a government loan uh, created because they want people to live in houses, basically. It, the, the government incentivizes home buying and home ownership. Yes, that's right. Yeah. So, um, FHA loan says if people meet certain parameters, we're gonna tweak um, the parameters on their credit score in order to give them a house, right? So, generally, if you're just going to get a regular loan, you need at least a 680, right? Most people don't have a 680. So, they said, we'll lower it to 580 if your credit, your debt to income ratio is, excuse me, your debt to income ratio is okay. If you have steady employment, and things like that, they'll lend you a house. Now, typically it costs you more money up front, like you have to show uh, responsibility by having a higher down payment. But FHA loans are three and a half percent. And, you know, at the lowest 580, I actually just did one. Um, and I was gonna say, for disclosure, I've never, since I started buying properties because of the nature of, and the aggressive nature of my business, I've never actually had over a 650 since I think I started buying houses. Now that's by design because I use money out of pocket or credit to renovate, but I've had over a 650 and I own four. So don't let credit be a deterrence like Sade said. There's definitely ways to get around it. There's all types of loan products. And at the end of the day, the more money you have down, the looser the regulations are. So to follow up on that question, um, what's an appropriate loan to debt ratio? You know, for those who don't know, um, help me 
loan to debt. So like the amount that the loan is versus the amount of debt you already got. Correct. Okay. So 41% is in order to qualify for an FHA loan, right? Yeah. Um, and I think it's like 38% for conventional loans. So this has to do, those, those numbers are correct, but this also has to do with building relationships and what bankings you go through. So if you use a credit union or a community bank, they'll tweak the numbers for you a little more. So for instance, I had a debt to income ratio that was around 50 to 52%. And what happened was I already had two properties and I had a relationship with the bank. So they made a call, sent a letter, and they approved it. Um, so it's also about, I always tell people, go to credit unions first, go to the smaller banks where you can actually sit down with somebody, build a relationship, because the commercial banks have no incentive to actually loan, particularly to us in our community. If anybody's been reading about Wells Fargo and what they've been going through, a lot of discrimination coming down the chute with minorities involving home buying and home ownership. But those smaller community banks value that money, regardless of what you look like, so you have a better chance of getting in with them. And like I said, anytime you can get in front of somebody and build a personal relationship, that matters, that goes a long way. Yeah, don't go to Bank of America, don't go to Wells Fargo, go to a small bank, like 100%, yeah. I can attest to that. Um, we're, we're gonna have Q&A in just a bit. Can I get a time check? Time. Eight fifty three. Okay. Yeah, we're going to give a few more questions. There were a few more things we wanted to get into, and then we're going to open up for audience Q and A. Show of hands. Who has questions? All right. Beautiful. Okay. I'm with it. All right. Um, so a follow up question I had to both of y'all responses. What I'm hearing here is, and this is I've been hearing this before. You're talking about. They say credit is king or something like well no, cash is that's I heard that saying, but it sounds like credit is being used a lot in order to like, I guess make dividends, I guess, pretty much. So is that is is that what I'm hearing? Like so like you're using credit to purchase property and So so cash is king is the same. Right. Credit, loans, all those things are your friend. So here's the deal. So when the president, I go back to him, when he went and he did these, these big deals and you know, Atlantic City and all that, he went to a bank and got $100 million, right? He didn't pay that out of pocket. Um, when you look at what's happening with the housing market, when you really look behind the scenes of what's going on with the housing market, after everything crashed, people went and financed the properties when they were at rock bottom, and that's how, that's why we have this market squeeze now. A company called BlackRock went and bought up all the property, and now they're just like kind of auctioning it off at their discretion, artificially inflating the market. At the end of the day, and this is something that I think is kind of in the spirit of us as African American people, we always had to find alternative means of financing things. We couldn't just go as a small business to a bank and say, hey, this is my business plan, can I get some money, right? Like that's, that's not historically worked. That hasn't worked and we've been entrepreneurs since the plantation. So for me, my thing is like, do it now, don't wait on it. So if there's any opportunity at 24 years old for me to buy a property, I'm gonna do it. When I went to that bank, I went to that bank to get a car. And what I told the lady, I was like, you know, I'm looking at this car, you know, boom. And of course, automatically approved me for that. But I was like, how far would I need to go? What would I need to do to get a mortgage? I was just curious. And I asked the question, and she said, I'll give you like $20,000, basically, which in Greensboro, you can get a house for $20,000. You can't do that up here. Um, but essentially, I had to make a decision. Now, I'm making $19,000 a year. It's, it's tight. I'm running into the red every month, right? But Credit was an opportunity for me to create an investment at that point, right? I knew that if I rented a room out, I knew that uh, long term I would make more money if I made that decision there than I would if I did, right? And once again, when I bought my second property, once again, I took my student loan money. I had a refund check for grad school and I took that money and I put that in as a down payment for the house. And then I financed the renovations with two credit cards, right? So once again, I don't own four properties without that. Now full disclosure, once again, don't be a dumb investor. If you buy a property and you're gonna renovate it with credit, make sure that it's gonna be worth more than what you put into it on the renovation. I was smart enough to do that. But yeah, credit is, and, and loans are how you move forward. Even these major companies that we look at are borrowing money. Microsoft and Google are borrowing money at incredibly high rates. They go to a bank and they go get the money when they wanna do research and development. Everybody knows about Tesla. Tesla isn't even profitable. It's subsidized by the government. They, I think they lost like a dollar thirty-eight per share last. They're, they're not last month. 
No, they're not. I think they're going out of business. That's a whole other conversation. Yeah. But in general, these major corporations borrow money, so we got to get it out of our head. Like, borrowing money is not bad. It's what you do with that money when you borrow it. Like I said, if I go get a personal loan because I just want to live a lifestyle, that's no good. Now, if I'm making an investment, that's good. I want to piggyback off of that. Because what he's speak, speaking specifically to is strategy. So you've got to figure out what your strategy is and how to, and to, it's not, it's a risk, but it's a smart risk. So you're analyzing, you're figuring out, okay, if I have this amount of money and I'm putting it here, what is, what is my potential to get back from putting my money here? I did the same thing in terms of for the renovation for my first house because I wanted to rent out rooms. So the rooms and you know had to be decent enough for me to get renters. So I had spent about ten thousand dollars renovating the house, but knowing that I was going in terms of the location of where I purchased the house being key, and then the, um, how much I could get for each room, calculating okay I'll make that money back up in a year. The following year I'll be making a profit based off of the investment I made. And I would no longer have that ten thousand dollars in that anymore. So. And I think we would be remiss too if we didn't talk about the opportunity to make money without necessarily borrowing money, right? So what I tell people is that if you want to create new income for yourself, you go buy real estate because real estate is the only place where they're gonna give you money, and you can make a profit. Like we'll give you two hundred thousand uh, dollars, your mortgage will be a thousand dollars, knowing you can rent that property out for fifteen hundred to two thousand dollars and make you know a thousand dollars in that profit a month so if you need to create new income real estate if you want to grow cash that you have or not be adverse to risk the stock market and i know that we i found that as black people we're kind of afraid of the stock market but i'm sure a lot of people in here have 401ks and pensions and all that good stuff or buy a raise your money's being invested in the stock market if you didn't know it's just being lumped together in these things they call funds like mutual funds which are said to be less risky because they put a thousand stocks in the same pot so if one goes out of business yeah, but you're not making as much money on it. So if you have $5, you can invest in the stock market. Your $5 could be $10 next year, right? So what I figured out once I started creating new income and was kind of like, what do I do with this money now? was kind of like figuring out it had to be a better way as I started taking that new income and putting that there. So I look at it like an advanced savings account. I use a free trading app called Robinhood and I put my, I buy individual stocks, but there are also index funds that are, you know, a little simpler that you can just invest your money in and it grows your cash. Wow, let's give him a hand, y'all, please. Man. Yo. So my next question, and this um, this is pretty much, you know, for both of y'all. Um, hypothetically speaking, of course, can we talk about the return, you know, just the return on profit? You know, um, how does that look, I guess, from what you understand? You know, at what point, if we're talking about real estate, at what point will you make enough, I guess, to pay back the loan, and then get a profit out of that, or you know. So, <laughs> and you might be doing the same thing I'm doing. I don't look at it as me paying off the loan. So, a part, a part of my strategy is I'm looking at investing houses either to build equity, either to flip it, or as a rental in order to get passive income. But my objective isn't to pay off the loan um, because. To me, I'm not gonna make, I'm not making any money paying off the mortgage. Um, eventually, yeah, if I pay off the mortgage in how many years, 30 years or so, and then I have that house mortgage free, then yeah, I can rent it out and make more money off of that. But right now I'm trying to build as much um, passive income as I can, and then focus on that, in which I'll be making a lot more money versus me just trying to pay off the mortgage. <laughs> Every situation is different. Um, so I'll give you the numbers on my first property. My first property was less than 25,000. I think it was like $23,500 down in Greensboro, North Carolina. Um, two bedroom, one bathroom condominium. Uh, it rents for a minimum of $600 a month. So if you go $600 a month times 10, 6,000, because let's say it's just 90% occupancy. Um, so in conceivably five years or less, four years really, the house would be paid off if I was just putting all that money back to paying the house off and not spending any of it. So the thing that we have to understand is that renting is incredibly expensive whether we realize it or not. Remember the apartment buildings we live in or the houses we rent, whatever you're spending, they're probably paying about 50% on that. So if you got a rental property and you know, you're know you paying $2,000 for rent, then their mortgage is probably $1,000 in their pocket and that other thousand, right? When you even own a, or you rent an apartment, 
in a building. There's a number that they have for each unit in that building that they need to make. So if they charge you 1300, that unit might only be 300. So we gotta remember that. Um, so it came down to just paying the properties off. It would probably be a three to five year time horizon if I was reinvesting all that money. But once again, if you wanna you know, actually count that income and fill that income, you don't do that. Now, here's what I think people need to start doing, and I don't wanna to get too far on my soapbox, but I believe in freezing your spending. That was something my parents taught me. So I froze my spending when I was making about $60,000. So now, when I get new real estate income, I'm either investing in my stock portfolio or I'm paying down on mortgage debt. So it's all kind of uh, intertwined, but I would say once again, three to five years on the time horizon if you really want to be aggressive with paying the mortgage down and getting out of debt. Wonderful. Uh, before we open up the floor for Q&A, I uh, wanted to talk about politics, business and politics. Uh, for those of y'all who aren't aware, you know, there's always been this great debate, right, about our condition as people and how to best get out of it. You know, some of us, um, a good number of us, right, we believe in the power of voting and just civic engagement, really, you know, whatever your political party is on what spectrum, there's a belief that participating in that system is key, right, in changing our condition. We have another segment of our population who don't believe in any of that, and they pretty much want to focus on entrepreneurship, right? Really, you know, doing for self and getting up out of this hole that we find ourselves in. Um, last month, or however long ago, uh, like I said earlier, there was a beef, or not a beef, a, a discussion, a war of words, right, between Yvette Carnell and Boyce Watkins. Boyce Watkins, he has um, a series of videos, he does like an online school for whatever, um, Reckon, and he has like um, shows pretty much, or just events where he talks about entrepreneurship. Yvette Carnell, she's black politics, right? So they have this this discussion about what comes first, right? It's pretty much the whole WEB versus Booker T discussion, right? So my question to y'all, right? What is the mix between politics and business? Do we have black politics before black business? Do we have black business before black politics? What does that look like in terms of our situation? You need both. One can't work without the other. Um, I'll use an example. For instance, there's a lot of issues going on with Airbnb right now in these different states. They're um, basically coming down on certain laws for people who are renting out, um, which affect me as having a small black business. I have two renters. Um, currently using Airbnb. So part of that means that I now have to be politically engaged in that and you know talk with my um, local lawmakers about how that affects me and how that affects my business. Um, so I, I can't I can't even imagine how you do one without the other because any policies or laws that are put into place um, potentially can affect your business. And then as well as a community, if we want to do well and do better um, in terms of uh, economic growth, then we have to have businesses. So, you know. So, I think that as a community, we used to understand that there was a lesser of two people. So I'm not gonna say either party is 100% pro-black, but there's some clear differences in policies that affect us pretty adversely. I'm not gonna go to one of those, I will go to the tax bill that just passed, right? So uh, I own a company, Master Wealth Builder LLC, and I can now uh, use all my income as passed through income, which means my income from my real estate and stocks gets charged at about 20% or less, versus my ordinary income, which is probably getting taxed around 35%. So yeah, these things affect people. Now, conversely, that helps me on the capital gains side, but it doesn't actually help me on the tax side for my regular job, right? So I have to be aware of both of those things. There's kind of um, give and take there. Policies change that affect real estate, that affect money, that affect banking, all these things which you cannot escape, right? We cannot escape finances unless we're gonna start bartering again. Like we can't escape it. So these policies that are going through, we need to have a fundamental understanding of them. We need to understand how they affect us. Uh, we need to know what it means um, you know, when they cut Medicaid or Social Security. We gotta understand that if they cut your taxes here but then they raise your health care, you're still not gonna see that increase. There's there's all these different things that we need to understand. I mean, one of the things we lost just as real estate investors is we're not gonna be able to write off certain things that we used to be able to write off, right? So now I gotta figure out 
how, how I'm going to present my income? Do I need to change my, my business model? Do I need to go escort? Like all these different things that come up. And then there's even repercussions or consequences to businesses that you wouldn't even know or understand fully in terms of a policy that's implemented. Like one that is affecting, you know, um, the poor essentially in terms of giving them food stamps and things of that nature, that could affect, uh, like essentially affect businesses that own stores, like grocery stores and things of that nature. So there's ramifications of that too. So like, like I said before, I can't see a separation between the two. They both affect one another. And I think another thing that just policy-wise that we don't think about, like, I mean, gentrification kind of came out of policy, right? So being able to raise the taxable value on your property, so even if it's paid off, now you can't afford to pay the taxes and you have this flight out of D.C. into Prince George's County, right? Which, you know, is the richest black suburb. So all these things affect us, so we didn't think, right? That goes back to, are we all connected as black people, right? I might not think living on the other side of Southern Avenue that I have anything to do with somebody in Southeast, but now they're my neighbor due to some policies that took place, and what do you do about that, right? So from my, from my window as a social studies teacher, I can actually see an older project building, and then there's a new housing development like right behind it, like in the backdrop. And I talk to my students about it, and I say, how do you feel about that? How do you feel about people not being able to live in their own communities, or being you know, removed from their communities due to policies that are said to, this is gonna improve the Southeast 8th Ward, right? The, the people in the 8th Ward are no longer the people who were in the 8th Ward, right? So my question is, matter of fact, let's open it up. Ma'am, floor is yours. Okay, good evening. Uh, glad to see both of you and hear the dialogue. I have a sister, a daughter named Shalom, and I would like to keep in touch with both of you. But my, my point was, because we know DC has gone through so many changes, I feel more of us in this audience should join the DC Statehood Green Party and support Jill Stein and Ajamu Baraka. Um, the Republican and the Democratic Party, we know, think on the same line. And there is a growing need for our representation in Congress. Um, I don't know if any of you know that a few years ago, uh, Lasana Mack, Mr. Lasana Mack was the chief financial uh, manager. But he was supposed to testify against Gandhi, who was also in up there in high ranks. Well, Mr. Lasana Mack was found hung in Northeast Washington off Eastern Avenue. Could you, could I show, could you show me by lay, hand, lay of your hand whether you have ever heard of Mr. Lasana Mack, who founded an organization called Appeal? Well, you need to do your research. There's, um, Appeal has been going on for years now, and there are people who are to vote every Saturday morning at Thurgood Marshall Center between the hours of 10.30 and 12.30, where you can get, you can get wonderful financial education. Okay, um, another thing about flipping houses, I'm really adamant against that because that's how I lost my house in the upper Northwest. And I think that there are too many opportunities to flip houses that belong to people who are trying to get out of foreclosure. And foreclosure is such a, trumped up process that's being headed by a lot of these um, Shapiro and Brunson cooks out of Leesburg, Virginia. You know, everybody, everybody is hounding on DC. We have to be conscious that we have to do more. We have to be, and you young people have to be investigative reporters. You can't just sit back, listen to the news, um, you can listen to WPFW, Democracy Now!, but you should cut off those other stations that feed you a lot of baloney and get the facts and understand that we've been under attack. We've been in war for a long time. And it's nice to hear the talk about how you invest in your money and perhaps we can help each other more and have entrepreneurship. Um, entrepreneurship begins in elementary school. You know, I, I really am glad you're having this but I want you all to think seriously about switching over to DC Statehood Green Party. Look at the people who are leading the cause so that we can get voting representation and get all these plans out of Congress. Thank you. So you said flip. Um, I'm actually, I'm actually anti-flip. I know you don't agree with me, but I'm actually anti-flip. And the reason why I'm anti-flip is because 
when you flip a house, you make a bunch of money and that's great. But when the economy turns, then you're just sitting on that pile of money. You have no residual income, nothing coming in. And flipping houses does not create generational wealth. It's kind of like the fast money thing right now. So at the end of the day, I own four properties. I can pass those down. I can't just pass down that $100,000 that I'm going to spend and also get taxed at a higher rate. And if you look at the time horizon on the money you make as a rental property versus flipping a house, that same house I might have made $100,000 on, I make that money in four years. But then I might make it for the next 80 years that I'm alive. Um, so I agree with you, the flipping house thing uh, is not always the best. The other thing is that, yeah, in Baltimore, you can go buy somebody's house right now who has a lien on their house. And then what you can do is, when they try to buy the house back, name your interest rate. So I can essentially buy your house from you based on the tax lien, which might be $5,000. I pay that cash. And then if you want to buy the house back, I have to give you a fair opportunity, but I can charge you a 50% interest rate. So there is a lot of, there is a lot of vulturousness uh, to it in specific communities, particularly the urban communities, Southeast DC, Baltimore, Detroit, all these communities that have been affected um, by industry leaders. Um, now, I understand that the issue in terms of foreclosure, like I understand why it may seem a little vulture-like as you described, however, if we don't buy the houses, then someone else is gonna buy them. So I feel as though, especially as people of color, if we have the opportunity to buy a house, even if it's foreclosure, it's better for us to own the property versus someone outside of our community. And as well, I feel as though it depends, again, on your strategy. Yeah, flipping house may not have the residual income as a rental, but if you're using that money to invest in a business or something else, then you need that high, however value it is. That would be a, 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 another way for you to do that, so. Okay, perfect. Here you go. I have a question. So, but I'm speaking to the mic. People on Facebook need them to hear you too. <laughs> Two things. Um, I actually grew up in these cities. Um, I've, I've, I've seen the gentrification. So, let's say, what, what were the people in Shaw or Petworth, or Michigan Park, uh, 16th Street? How were they supposed to save their houses? They could have rented out rooms. How can you rent out rooms when you have four or five kids? Sacrifice. I mean, it's, I, I, it might sound heartless, but essentially, you they could have moved out of the house, got an apartment for cheaper, and then made more money renting out that house and getting that income versus not paying anything at all and losing the house. I personally think it was a, more of a raw deal. And it was systematic. I think it was another example of systematically trying to move black people off of prime real estate, systematically trying to relocate your poor, which we see not just in America, every country. The problem is that I think this is more of a letdown of those black people who actually have means, have money, have power, right? Mm -hmm. So if I'm a multi-millionaire and I see a community of people who look like me being affected, maybe I do go in and I purchase those properties so I can keep those people in their homes, right? So on a small level as a... But when you say keep them in the, like how, okay, so if they go in and buy, purchase that property, how would they be able to keep them in their home? Because so if they don't have the means to pay for the house, how would they be able to live there? So, so this is what I'm talking about in terms of financial literacy, meaning that if we as a people were able or had that viable information to share with them in terms of how to save their house, that would have helped them. Not saying, you know, the policies weren't there that were definitely, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like, detrimental. Detrimental, yeah, detrimental. Um, but I'm saying as in, there are means or there's ways around it. I mean, I grew up in D.C. too, so I saw the gentrification myself. I mean, I don't think it's easy. You can't just rent out I didn't say it was easy. You can't just rent out a house that's one half dilapidated. I mean, no one wants to live there. First off, people that live there don't want to live there. So, trying to make somebody pay to live there? I mean, what I'm saying, I'm not saying that this is the all be solution. I'm not saying that this is the best solution. I'm saying that this is a way for somebody to save their house if they're going through a financial situation. So if I lose my job today, and I have a mortgage on my current house that I have to pay, I would move out of my house and rent it out and get an apartment for like a studio apartment probably somewhere out there 
for a cheaper amount so that I can still keep the house and I'm gonna go into foreclosure. So it's all about how you strategize to get out of your situations. But at, at the end of the day, when you take out a mortgage, you're saying I am responsible enough and I can afford to pay for this mortgage. And then if for whatever reason you lose a job or what have you, something happens, then it is the right of the bank to foreclose on your house. And because you're borrowing money when you get a mortgage, you're not paying for the house full out. You're you're borrowing money so that you can pay them back over a long period of time for the house. But I think that that we we can't just talk about the people who own properties, but the people who had homes in those apartments, which is like the people you're talking about who rented homes from a landlord in an apartment building. Somebody decides, eh, yeah, we're going to tear this building down and build something newer, and now those people are displaced, correct? Yes, so I took a housing and consumer economics class in college, which is one of the reasons I got inspired to buy real estate. Um, in Detroit, I don't know if everybody knows kind of the story of Detroit, not only did industry leave Detroit, but what happened was that um, HUD, the Housing and Urban uh, Division, gave money to landlords, um, thinking that they would be responsible enough to make the decision to actually renovate those properties, rebuild those properties, fix those properties, right? DC, they kind of skipped that step. DC, they said, you know what? I don't want to be a landlord anymore. I'm putting this, this is going to the government. We're going to condemn this building. These people have to get out in 60 days. And then what happens? Somebody who's a big time contractor who doesn't look like us gets money to come in and build the the metro place at Georgia Ave. You know what I mean? And that's, and that's the problem. Those people couldn't have saved their homes because those people didn't own it. Now that goes back to ownership, right? Like we gotta find ways to own things. And part of the reason why most of my properties are working class properties is because I wanna make sure people who look like me don't get this place. And I've seen that happen both ways. So I, I agree with you, there's nothing they could have done. The only thing we can do as a people is own more, right? If a black person owned those apartment buildings, maybe they make a different decision. Maybe the money's used differently. No, no, because they have to pay for all the utilities for that apartment building. That's Let me let my sister talk first if you don't mind, then you can talk, yes. and then the brother can grab what it is. Alright, so we'll do... Mm -hmm. I ain't gonna yes, I'm ready. Okay. Um, good evening, first everyone. Good evening. I'm Naima. And this is a quick question I had for you all, because I've been to a couple of real estate um, seminars. So I was like, dang, I want to learn about these hustles. <laughs> so uh, when I was there, I went to one real estate, they said something about buying houses and everything like that. And then I went to another one and said, the better uh, one to invest into is buying apartments. They said, and with that, you can make a better, um, uh, make more money, basically, from with that. Instead of buying a house, you can make more money with an apartment because all you have to do is um, hire a management company to manage your apartment. You will have no... Uh, uh, no responsibility to the actual apartment, you just be your owner. So that's what I was told that that would be a better investment when it comes to <laughs> yeah, so um, you're kind of talking about the difference between residential real estate and commercial real estate. So the difference with commercial real estate is you need more money, you need more net worth, you need more assets. So to go buy, let's say a 10 multi-unit, I have a guy who's in my investor group who's just trying to purchase a 10 unit in Baltimore, 10 one bedroom units. Um, it's going to cost him 700000 he's going to need about 70000 down at a minimum. And he's actually getting a good deal. So commercial real estate is a lot tougher. They normally want 20% and you need to have like immaculate credit along with assets that they can seize if you were not to pay. Residential real estate is really a segue into the commercial industry. So I buy um, single family properties. Eventually I'll buy hopefully duplexes and multi-units and hopefully eventually graduate to that commercial side. In regards to the real estate seminars and all that, in reality, everything you need to know is already on the internet. There's a YouTuber or somebody like that. Like, it's really a racket. A lot of the people who are doing the real estate seminars, they're like, all right, let's charge you $200 and we're gonna give you this part. Then we're gonna charge you another 200 for this part. Everything I learned about real estate, I learned between word of mouth, talking to people who have mortgages, and the internet. So I would advise that you go and you do like your own research, figure out a strategy, talk to people who own a mortgage or talk to people who are investors and then figure it out from there because everybody's strategy is slightly different as well. Okay, 
Okay, my name is Emma Ward. What you all see happening in Washington, D.C. now didn't just start. 35 years ago, they were planning Southwest. And the reason I know is because I lived down there. I was working in government. There were a few of us who took advantage. We listened. We went to work during the day and we bought houses in the United bought 14. Let me tell you what's happening now. And I know many of you don't want to go to Baltimore because you always hear about the crime. But I can tell you what's going on. I go out there almost every Saturday. They have a program called North Avenue Rising. I bought a house two years ago, 21,000. I bought a house in 2006, 7,000. I went and I found out what they were doing for Park Avenue, Park Heights Avenue. Pimlico is right there. They want to buy all of that area. From 2006, guess when they bought my house? 2015. They have another program going on at Coppin State University. They're buying up everything. They bought the only lumber company that would allow you to buy a piece of lumber that would go across a long piece of the property. They bought it. There was a corner store on the corner. They gave the black people a price they couldn't refuse. They've already demolished it. On the right side, they've already built the place. On the left side, they got one coming up. So guess what's happening? The developers who have been successful here in Washington, D.C., are moving into Baltimore. I get letters every day asking to buy my houses. And they will give you a reasonable price, but I can tell you what they know what's going on over there. So we have to look beyond a lot of things, and many properties that I have bought, word of mouth. I, the one that I bought two years ago, the lady hasn't lived in it. I found out from a neighbor, I had been keeping the yard, and I found out from a neighbor that she was selling houses and getting ready to close on as soon as we get the title search. So you don't have to have a whole lot of money. You, have, you can get two or three people and you can decide what you want to do. And first of all, you have to decide do you want to own property, do you want to make money? Like when I owned a house down in Southwest, oh, I had some money, but it was all tied up in my property. So guess what? My son and I decided we were going to sell our houses and pay for houses cash in Baltimore. And so the same number that we bought in D.C., that's the goal about the same number in, in Baltimore. So go beyond the convenience. You know they get ready to try to build a train that comes here in 15 minutes, right? They took it out to the rich area of uh, Mitchellville, and the Mitchellville folks out there said, oh no, you're not coming out here. So now the next proposed area is uh, Capitol Heights. But they want to give the people in Capitol Heights a price that they can't refuse. And they're going to do the same thing in Baltimore that they're doing here in D.C. Watch, 15 or 20 years from now, it's going to be just like it is now. You all need to understand that this didn't just happen yesterday. Many of us who bought houses a long time ago, we know. So I'm just giving you some information. You can act on it if you want to. Yes. Oh, no. Are you done? I'm sorry. And the biggest problem you have out there is collecting your rent. But that doesn't affect your property. I have a question. Real quick. Go ahead, let Thank you so much. <laughs> the best. Uh, not, not my fault, man. Uh, would you mind just telling us a little bit about yourself? Okay. You okay. First of all, I'm from a ba I'm a Bama, and I wear it. <laughs> nice. I picked cotton. Okay. You don't believe me? I still have soft hands. I came here in 1959. If I had stayed in Alabama, I would have graduated with a class of 11 people. When I got to Washington, D.C., and I got off at Human Station, I said, they didn't tell me that Washington, D.C. had a top on it. But I saw the value. I didn't know that when I was in Alabama that they could call the black schools Clark County Training School. And I came here, and I said, oh, I went to Clark County Training School in Alabama.